welcome to the Asian Connection Mortgage Podcast, where we connect Asian Canadians together to talk about anything related to real estate, mortgages, and finances, based out of Vancouver. Our host is John Lee, mortgage broker with Arise Mortgage. Grab a bubble tea and enjoy the episode. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode on the Asian Connection Mortgage Podcast. And our guest today is Daryl and Tia Ho. And we're going to be talking about how to save your down payment faster. How's it going, guys? Great. Good, good, good. Hi, John. Hi. Thanks for uh, joining us. And perhaps you guys can start just to share a little about yourself and what you guys do. Okay, so yeah, I guess a little bit about us. We are a husband and wife financial advisor team. We've been in the business for about 10 years. I've invested since 2001, so it's been well over 20 years of investment experience. Um, I guess what sets us apart is we are independent advisors. Um, we, we don't just work with one financial institution. We have access to a whole bunch of other ones. And we also kind of take a step back and look at overall everybody's kind of financial picture. We don't just do like one certain product. It kind of depends on what they need. We'll find custom solutions for them. So before we dive into talking about how to uh, grow a down payment faster. I, I like to start with something a little bit lighter, kind of like icebreaker questions. So I have eight this or that questions okay. for okay. each of you. There, I'm going to put you on the spot first uh, with the this or that, and I'll, okay. I'll hop over to, to Tia. So are you ready? Sure, yeah, yeah let's go. Okay, <laughs> here we go. This or that, beach vacation or mountain retreat? I've done beach vacations before, so I'd be up for mountain retreat. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Pizza or burgers? Burgers. Oh, yeah, me too. Yes. And, and I've, I've been over to your place, and you make really good burgers. Oh, Angus burgers. Oh, so good. Um, early bird or night owl? Night owl. Summer or winter? Summer. I don't get why that's even a question. Like <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're from Vancouver, so summer all the way. Cats or dogs? Oh, I used to grow up with cats, but I actually like dogs more now. Okay. Yes. Oh, and you have quite a few too. You have two, right? Two dogs, yes. Ah. Yeah. They're, They're being super so, cute. Story of the family is it's great. Reading a book or watching a movie? Watching a movie. <laughs> I, I don't I don't like reading. <laughs> I'd rather watch a movie than to read the novel. And Tia is the opposite. She'd rather read the novel than watch a movie. Yeah. But I, I find books are usually better though. Do you do you find that's the case? I don't I'm kind of boring. The books that I read are financial planning books or personal oh. books. I don't I don't read novels. So if I have time to read, it's gotta be something that's gonna improve an aspect of my life. Yeah. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Amusement park or museums? Amusement park. Oh, yeah. I love that. I love the thrills, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tia, your turn. Okay. This is kind of interesting, John, because we're a married couple. So this yeah. kind of feels like our wedding. <laughs> <laughs> the shoe game, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it kind of feels like. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is like going back 20 years from now. <laughs> Trying to keep it fun and, right. and, and fresh, right? Okay. We're, we're all young. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting listening to Daryl's questions because then we don't we, we kind of just know each other. We've been together for 30, 30 plus years. years. Yeah. Um so yeah, I'm like, oh really? were, were any of his answers surprising to you? A little bit. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll just end this podcast after these <laughs> questions and like yeah. <laughs> okay. Um right. this or that. Yeah. Wait. Pancakes or waffles? Oh, I like pancakes. But Daryl makes really good waffles. So during the morning, I usually make the pancakes so the kids want pancakes. And then Daryl makes the waffles so the kids want waffles. Best of both worlds. Yep. <laughs> uh, city life or countryside? City life. Netflix or YouTube? Ooh, ooh, ooh depends <laughs> what's on. Um, right now, Netflix. Netflix? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Amazon. I, I would assume... Better content, I mean, you're paying for it. Yeah. Camping or staying in a hotel? Oh, yeah. Okay. Before, <laughs> when the kids were young, camping. Yeah. But as they are growing up now, they're teenagers. Absolutely staying in a hotel. <laughs> more, way more comfortable than sleeping on the floor. 
I know, and you're on on vacation. Why, yeah. why, why downgrade to camping? <laughs> yeah, glamping, glamping. I could do glamping. <laughs> Action movie or comedies? Ooh, I would say comedy. Bungee jumping or skydiving? Ooh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to tick up that answer like when you're like signing up for insurance right yeah yeah totally <laughs> but you know what daryl has done both so oh, okay. he's definitely the thrill seeker out of us too and uh when he did go skydiving he did it without telling me and he told me after uh, he did that and landed and said oh by the way i went skydiving today <laughs> <laughs> fiction or non-fiction Ooh, fiction and last, this or that, swimming pool or hot tub? Oh, swimming pool. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, hot tub. You can only stay for, for there, you know, oh, for true. too long. You can't stay there too long, but swimming pool. Okay, back to Daryl. This is uh, now a would you rather questions. Like, I, I got two would you rather questions. Here we go. Okay. So number one, first one. Would you rather be able to fly or be invincible? Invisible or invincible? Invincible. Invincible, Ooh. I would say invincible. <clears throat> invincible, okay. Invincible, yes. Uh, and then the second one is: Would you rather have the ability to speak all languages, or be able to play every musical instrument perfectly? Ooh. I would do languages. Languages. I would too, especially for our role. If I had we're to like talking to so many different people. The other one would be pretty cool as well too. Yeah, yeah but but uh, as Asian parents, we'll 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 hire someone to teach them and have <laughs> them play for us, right? <laughs> uh, okay, Tia, to you. Oh, okay. Uh, would you rather live without the internet or without air conditioning or heating? Oh. Oh, well, that's kind of hard. You can't live without the internet these days, <laughs> right? Um, everything is on the internet. So yeah, I would probably, I could probably do without the air conditioning. Oh, okay. Yeah. And last one, would you rather have unlimited international first class tickets or never have to pay for food at restaurants? Oh, oh. That's wow. Okay. I well, that's that's hard, John, because I love traveling and I love eating equally. So, nice. um, okay. Um, is yeah. I don't want to pay for any. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to pay. That would be <laughs> that would be scary, right? Unlimited is basically like all you can eat all day, every day, uh, but yeah. uh, every day. Uh, but that sounds a little bit more appealing. Yeah, really oh, that does. Okay, yeah. so go for the food. Yeah, go for the oh, food. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know what's funny it's probably like you might end up just going to like still a and w and mcdonald's and <laughs> <laughs> bubble tea. Bubble tea. can you imagine bubble tea all you can drink oh. bubble tea hands down my yeah. daughter like that. <laughs> and what would you like on your topping uh i have bubbles and the grass jelly and this and that <laughs> awesome oh that was really fun and i hope everyone was able to uh get to know a little bit more about you guys and so we're just going to dive into today's topic now um so what would you say would be good ways to grow a uh, down payment for someone who's saving up to buy a home down payment i would always lean because a new fhsa the first home savings account came out i would lean towards utilizing that first because that's specifically for first time home buyers for down payment whereas rsps you can use for other things offset capital gains yeah. higher income, et cetera. So start with the FHSA first. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, that one came out in 2023. And mm -hmm. from my understanding for that account, uh, it is a hybrid of like TFSA, so tax-free savings account, and the RSP. Mm -hmm. um, each year, one could contribute up to 8000 per year. Yeah. And it was really uh, tricky though. Because you don't get the contribution room if you actually don't, if you actually don't open it. Is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah, you have to open the account to get that clock to start ticking. So if you didn't open it in 2023, um, you can only get 8,000 for this year. But anybody that was smart that opened it end of last year, and you don't need to make a contribution, you just need to open it just to get that clock to start ticking. So yeah. anybody that opened it last year, including this year, they can do 16,000 combined. So it can roll over one year if you don't use it. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned uh, RSP. Um, so that is the registered retirement savings account. Um, because of the name, the retirement, lots of people think it is for saving out for retirement, but there's actually an incentive for first home buyers. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, you, you, when you put the money in towards RSP, like you can reduce how much taxes you pay because you're deferring that portion of taxes in terms of income. Um, with RSP as your home buyer plan, you're allowed to take up to 60000 It was thirty five before. Uh, it's now $60,000 you can put in per individual towards a down payment towards a home. If you take out that 60000 it does not count as taxable income. Um, so then you're able to put it in, get your tax deduction, take it out. Don't worry about taxes. Uh, but you do have to pay it back over 15 years. Um, and then again, in the past, it was you had to wait about two years and then you start paying one fifteenth off. But now they've extended to five years. So that's not bad. That helps with the overall planning that when we get to the five year mark is do you want to pay back that one fifteenth or not? And yeah. that's where we kind of come in and give people guidance. Should you pay back or not? Most people think you have to, but strategically, sometimes it makes sense to don't pay it back and just count that as income for the year. But it's a good way to, because a lot of people put money away into RSPs. That's what they're programmed to do. Uh, it's a good way to pull back out that sixty up to sixty thousand uh, towards the home. Mm. So I want to dive deeper into strategy. Um, yeah. Like with these accounts, I'm, I'm sure it's, someone could just Google it and find more information about how all these accounts work. But the the strategy that part you can't just easily just Google it. So I want to get more insight from you guys since you are financial planners and investment advisors. So if someone trying to save and they have say like 40,000 in their account mm -hmm. and they are also on top of that, trying to put money away to save up for the down payment to increase the more, because we all know 40,000, that's probably not enough if you're trying to buy something in Vancouver. What would you say to this person? How would, how would you structure it so that they're able to maximize the, the returns? Okay, I guess it, it, for me, a lot of it depends on the timeline. <clears throat> if someone's going to be buying in the short term, then let's use up that FHSA room as fast as we can uh, because either you use it or you lose it. Um, if, they, if it's somebody that's really young and they may not buy for another 10 years, then it'll just... Um, most likely the affection say as fir first as well, because eventually over time, over the next 10 years, the person's income will likely go up. So there's no point in kind of burning up or using up the RSP room until you're, you're in higher income years. Um, if we know that they're not going to buy for at least five years and their income is going to go up, I may say, you know what, let's put money into the TFSA in the meantime, if we've already maxed out your FX FHSA, and then later on, when you hit a certain tax bracket, then we strategically, okay, here's a year we want to put a little bit into the RSPs. And then maybe at the year that you're actually going to buy, we can actually top off and put more into the RSP at that time and just kind of put it in just to take it out. But don't put money into RSPs for the sake of doing it. No random numbers. Because uh, a lot of clients that we meet, they, they put 5,000 a year, 10,000 a year, but where are you coming up with this number and what is your income at? And that's really the, the key thing is what is your income at now and what's going to look like before you buy? Then we can kind of plan a little bit further ahead because if you're only making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, it doesn't really make sense to put money into RSPs. You wait to the 80, 100,000 or more income. That's where you get more meaningful tax deductions. So that's mm -hmm. where we would kind of take a look at the overall picture and timeline. So in general, the kind of the, the idea and the steps would be first, first home savings account. Yeah. And then number two, you would, put money into if they were going to buy in the short term like let's say within one or two years it depends on the taxes i guess if they know we're going to buy then you can do the rsps okay um, they're going to buy later on then that's where you might want to do the tfsa in the meantime and then when the income is higher we would do the rsps so short term FHSA, once that's maxed out do rsp second but if you don't need to buy right away and it's not for two to five years or longer then put kind of tfsa in the middle before you start topping off your rsps Right, got it. So 
um, once they put the money in the account, what do you think would be a good way to maximize their return? Uh, yeah, just really investing is kind of the key. Everybody's risk tolerance is different. Some people may want to maximize the returns, but they're really scared of losing money. Yes. So it just it comes down to the risk tolerance, uh, whether they want to be like a balance kind of in the middle investor profile to growth or aggressive. Um, it all comes out again, time, comes out in timeline. If somebody's going to be needing that money within a year or two, we don't go as aggressive. If somebody is young, like 18, starting to put money away, they're not going to probably buy to their late 20s. Then we'd put it into more of a growth or aggressive portfolio yeah. because, you know, we can have a chance to maybe 15 plus percent returns. You may get a negative 15 percent as, as the worst case scenario. We don't want to be doing that if you're going to need that, if you need that money within a couple of years. So you mentioned about different risk tolerance. Um, we hear a lot of like balance and then growth or conservative. I understand what those mean, but in terms of the rate of return, what would you say would be the the range of the rate of return within those categories? Yeah, good, good question. Oh, for, for in terms of again, everybody's different. In terms of our experience, whenever we have any balanced portfolios, we're probably looking at that six to eight percent range is kind of expected return. If it's less, then we're not doing a good job managing the portfolios. Okay. Uh, for somebody in the growth category, that'd be more like the eight to ten uh, percent plus range, yeah. and then anything aggressive would be like twelve percent to eighteen percent would be kind of that aggressive range. Oh wow, no, that's really high. And I understand you also mentioned like okay. There are maybe some years where you actually get 50% or like, and then some years will be like negative 20 or 30% because markets, it, it fluctuates a lot. But I just want to emphasize what, what you're sharing is the average return. And when we talk about averages, like what would you say would be a good time horizon to so that the returns that you mentioned will actually fit within that range? I would say actually within within a year or two, like two oh, max. Okay. Yeah, if you're in a balanced portfolio and, and the kind of the target is six to eight percent, you won't get a negative fifteen. It'll be like a negative six to eight. So it's always kind of the same swing. The only time you would have like maybe like a negative fifteen percent return is you know with an aggressive portfolio trying to hit that twelve to eighteen percent return, then you might get negative, you know, fifteen if it happens to be like a COVID year type of thing and and the market goes down. But everything's all diversified. It's not 100% in stocks. Even even our aggressive portfolio is not 100% in stocks. So you're yeah. never going to have like a negative 30 or 40% return. It just doesn't happen because a certain portion of each portfolio put together uh, are like in fixed incomes and it just can't go down. So it's never that big of a swing. If somebody wants 20, 30, 40% returns, it'd be more like a day trader, right? Somebody that's trading stocks, maybe picking like five to 10 stocks at a time, whereas all our portfolios are 50 to 100 plus different companies. Um, unless it's like a global meltdown, there's, there's no way every single sector will all drop so aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of questions also about like what to invest in. Like, so for me, I remember when I was saving up, I did stocks, but then also um, I, I hit some stocks that had great returns and then some like, negative return but thankfully like you no know, on average i did pretty well but now there's a lot of talks about being more passive i guess i don't know if that's the word but lots of people talking about like just buying the market like uh the s p 500 uh, index fund the uh nasdaq no don't don't just buy one apple stock or something like buy the whole tech industry what are your thoughts on that? For me, maybe because of my age, <laughs> the more to at stake if, if money, if uh, we lose our clients' money, our own personal money, we're kind of like when we build a portfolio, it's kind of like that. It's like a basket of 50 to 100 plus different companies from all the different sectors, from tech to, you know, industrial to financial, et cetera. So that's kind of our style, which we like. Um, if anybody wants to be a little bit more aggressive and pick like your Teslas or your tech stocks, like one at a time, you kind of put maybe 10% of, of your savings into that. So that if it ends up blowing up or something doesn't work, you don't impact your overall portfolio. But usually like the 80, 20 or 80% of it should be something passive where, you know, there's portfolio managers that buy and sell within the individual fund itself. That's for me, gives a lot more peace of mind. I, I do day trading as well too and swing trading and, and good successes but I'm up every day. 
right? 6 30 in the morning here in the Pacific time zone, opening bells. Like I'm watching the stocks every day. And Friday nights and more Saturdays are my favorite because the markets are closed. Or anytime there's like a long weekend. Yeah. So you can sleep in. Not, I shouldn't say lose sleep, but it's always on my mind that when I wake up, okay, what is pre market trading? What's after hours trading? So right. then if I had my entire portfolio on that. I have a lot more gray hairs, whereas I just have like a small, small sliver of my net worth in trading. And the rest is more of that balanced, uh, not balanced, but the more kind of diversified portfolio. And those are making great consistent gains as well, too. So consistency over time is good versus like a good 50% return and then a negative 10%, like get the fluctuation, that volatility. They both work, but uh, for me, in terms of peace of mind, work-life balance is 80% should be more and more passive. Uh, versus like an aggressive investing. Would you say more people are now hesitant in buying real estate and just want to stick with stock market or it's still the same where people just want to invest and be a landlord? Oh, oh, for me, I, my perception is still the same. Yeah. If somebody needs to buy a home, they're still going to buy a home. It's just a matter of you know making sure the timing is right you know, can they afford it? Um, I don't think it has changed much. In terms of some of the rules, it's just more about tweaking some of our strategies. Right now that we know that, you know, RSPs maximum 60,000 is great. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you make in the RSPs, the max you can do is 60,000. Whereas with the FHSA, it doesn't matter how much it grows. It's unlimited, right? You can grow it past 60,000 and take out as much as you want out towards it on payment. Um, but then some people may not have extra money to contribute towards the FHSA. So then we would say, okay, well, why don't you just take your 60000 from your RSP, take another 8000 put into FHSA just to take it back out. So now you've kind of liquidated 68000 of RSPs when the rule is only 60000 but then you're allowed to transfer money from your RSPs to your FHSA mm -hmm. as a way to um, get around that. Yeah. But once oh, those that... rules, so and then if they, if they opened up an account last year, they get sixteen thousand. So all of a sudden, now you can actually promote. Here is how you can take out seven to eight thousand dollars of RSPs uh, for your down payment, even though the limit is sixty, because you kind of know the rules of FHSA. Mm -hmm. And some people may not have that extra sixteen thousand in surplus savings, but they have it all in the RSPs. And RSPs have grown so much, right? But you end up capped up to sixty thousand. But again. Again, another 16 to play with. So just kind of some of those creative strategies um, is what we try to do with all these rules and what else, what can we do to tweak it and get more out of it? Yeah. Make the best out of it. We're, we're closing to near near the end of the, the episode. And uh, I, I do have one more question to ask you guys. And I, I know when it comes to investing and saving up for a down payment, it's really important to start early. And I know both of you have, have kids. And I'm sure they're also trying to save as well. So for you guys as financial advisors, as parents as well, what are the tips and advice that you are uh, sharing with your kids or passing on so that they can save up for the down payment faster? Uh, yeah. I have two different perspectives on that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go first there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think from like more, because we, we've worked with a lot of clients, uh, seen a lot of different spending habits. Uh, teaching our kids certain things like don't be wasteful, uh, delayed gratification, right? If you don't need that latest and greatest iPhone, maybe just wait for a year or two. And who knows, you may not even need it till three, four years later on. And, and it's really important of saving up money. Um, so it kind of that, that the behavior of sa saving money, um, don't spend money that you don't have, teaching them that you have to get a credit card because without a credit card, you don't build credit, credit uh, score. And if you don't have a credit score, you, you can't get approved for mortgage. So then it's teaching them how to use a credit card responsibly, responsibly, really just using it to collect points and all the things around, you know, you know, if you're going to don't, don't charge that card unless you already have the savings and all those different th um, mentalities. Um, I'm going to go next and then I'll go again. No, I was just saying, just yeah. kind of modeling that behavior, right? That spending behavior, right? So, you know, for ourselves, Daryl and I, we're not, we're not wasteful, right? So, you know, when we, when we go out to restaurants, we're making sure we're ordering enough and not over, over too much and then leaving food behind, right? Or, you know, we're Asian, so we will always pack the food and bring it home. <laughs> but, but before you pack, you got asked. How much are the boxes? Oh, yeah. The 25 yeah. cents, 50 cents? <laughs> yeah. My, my mother-in-law has, whenever we go out for dinner, she'll text me and go, reminder, please bring your own container. Oh, it's a block containers with you. <laughs> you know what we do? We have containers in our trunk. 
Yeah. There at different go. sizes too, because we have tons of takeout containers when we do, especially during COVID time, we just kept them all. Yeah. And then now we're like, oh, we just leave it in a trunk. And yeah, when we have leftovers from like Hong Kong cafes, like they're huge portions. Yeah. We just like dump it into the in our containers and take home. And it, it totally makes sense. And you know what? Overall, not only you're saving just like a couple bucks, right? But it's better for the environment, right? Yeah, so we, we don't need any more take up containers, you know, in the landfill. So uh, yeah, just I, for, for me, it's just kind of modern that behavior, right? That responsibility with money. Um, you know, Daryl just, uh, what would say this year has loaded, um, their own credit card on their phone so we did have a conversation be between us going is that a smart choice giving a 15 and 17 year old their own credit card right it's under their name but of course we pay the bills um so it was like oh should we do that should we not do that um but what was the limit you put in though it, it was just our, it's our personal card so it's oh. about 40,000. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. That's a big limit, right? You see my concerns? Um, but that is fun, but, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's teaching about that, right? So we, we knew that they're going to be responsible. They're not going to be crazy. But, you know, this is good for emergencies. If they're out with their friends and, you know, they don't have cash, uh, they can charge it on their card. So, um, you know. If they we, don't have a ride, then they just buy a new car on the card. <laughs> 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 or that <laughs> or that um so yeah we were definitely like not sure if that was like the best choice but again you know it's about you know modeling that behavior and teaching them um you know what 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 we expect out of that right by giving them this privilege right and of course that privilege could be taken away right so if it's not responsibly used so um so far so good you know it really helps because again you know later on our daughter she's going to the she's going to the mall with her friends we don't have to worry that you know what she doesn't have any money and so forth right so um i guess a long you know to make a long, long answer short is just you really um yeah teaching them uh very young uh what to be responsible with money right and uh you know the the old saying like money doesn't grow on trees right money doesn't grow on trees right um you know it's true and then i think the kids see us working hard as well you know for for you know working hard every day to earn money right it makes them think a little bit twice about oh you know just kind of spending it no yeah. that's great advice and i'm learning from you guys too because your kids are older than mine and uh right now in terms of using credit card like my daughter would pick her stuff dollarama she loves going to the self checkout and just be like hand over the credit card so i can like know how to tap it and she loves that but she, i don't think she understands really how all that works where the money's coming from that's just what you do when you buy but yeah that that's great advice and definitely it takes time and many years of just modeling sharing all these like financial tips and also really like dumbing it down too because i know daryl you're you're helping people with um high net worth and their case will probably be a lot more technical in terms of structuring versus a high school kid <laughs> where you know it, it might not be as complicated but you also need to kind of have that mindset that all those skills to be able to uh explain it to to them in their type of language and person mm -hmm. so that they can absorb that type of knowledge too yeah just kind of sprinkling those things those are more kind of the mindset piece and if you want me to go for it more like what we also did with our kids is we opened up uh tfsa accounts under each of our own names and put all their you know birthday money red envelope money from chinese new year into it because then it's just instead of holding cash in the room uh we put into a tfsa investment account got them to choose a couple of funds to invest and then just kind of show them how money can make you more money mm. so, so they didn't do a good job the first couple of years on what to choose so i said forget it i'm just gonna build a portfolio for you <laughs> so now, now it has gone up whereas you know they chose it microsoft so google's and stuff like portfolios <laughs> with those tech companies and yeah and i guess at that time tech went down but so i rebalanced it and it's in a better position so we're just kind of teaching the kids like if you have the money here and then look at the opportunity costs and if you spent the money this is money that can make you more money if you didn't spend it so all about that delayed gratification piece and um, kind of starting with that. So that's maybe a tip to do is a separate account that's earmarked for them. It's under your name, but 
it's their money. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting for them to watch as well, right? So we actually we just gave them like a flat one thousand dollars off like uh, as the start, and that was actually pre COVID that they invested this money, right? So mm-hmm. pre COVID that one thousand dollars because it's a nice round amount, you could see it either go up or go down very easily, right? Yeah. Um, and then with the financial in- institution that we work with, um, I Financial, they have an app that you can kind of click on and it'll, you can click on every single day to see how your investments are doing. And it's very clear and easy for them to see. So, you know, at the beginning it was like, oh, it's up like, you know, $10 or like, oh, it's going up up to $50. I'm like, oh, and this is all just money, making money. Yeah. Exactly. You're not doing anything. This is what passive income is. Right. Um, and then COVID hit and then COVID hit, the markets went down and they saw that thousand dollars go down. Right. Mm-hmm. To, 900 yeah. and the with time they actually went down to like 800 and something yeah. and then like oh no mom what happened right what happened I'm did like, they want to sell know. sorry did they want to sell like did they feel the emotions and the ride oh, or were I, they just... not so much because okay. really it wasn't their money <laughs> oh okay they didn't have a need for that money <laughs> they didn't have a need for that money right so I you see. know so back then they were what they were they were much younger um so they didn't really get the fact that okay well that's money that i could use to buy this or that um so yeah but it was interesting for them to see it go down right go down and you know we always like it's not it's not about timing the market it's time in the market right you've heard that saying before and then over time right the markets correct itself we caught you know we kind of rolled out of covid and it went up Right, and it started to climb back up, and actually today it's at thirteen hundred dollars, which is oh wow, right? So you know that that one thousand dollars is now at you know they made three hundred dollars for not doing anything. So then now the conversation is like, what if that one thousand dollars? What if you times it by X amount, right? And imagine if you could save up to that point but let's say you saved up a million dollars right and there's the same return this is about three hundred thousand dollars of passive income that you can have right so it's it's that kind of teaching right that we're trying to give them that you know um you can start small right and then grow up to it yeah no that's 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 correct like uh that's also something i will want to share with my daughter um Maybe it's still too young. She's nine, but uh, yeah, I, I, but they're all growing up so quickly. Like they're becoming more mature, um, mm-hmm. a lot sooner than when we, when we were <laughs> kids with the internet and everything. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being on the show and sharing your wealth of knowledge. How would people be able to find you guys? Uh, best thing is probably just go to our website. It's uh, wealthblueprint.ca. Uh, all our content information is there. You can reach out and book a schedule with us. Sorry, schedule the time to meet up with us. Phone number, emails are all there. A bit of our story is on there as well too. And and some of the things that we specialize in. So it's our, our website, wealthblueprint.ca. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Yes, yes. Thanks yeah. so much for having us. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review and subscribing to our podcast on your favorite platform. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Asian Connection Mortgage Podcast.